I'm building the ZX Spectrum, but not with a normal Z80 CPU. This one's based on a random access Turing machine, a modernised version of Alan Turing's 1936 abstract machine. Up until now, that's meant two or three huge EPROMs just to store the state machine, and it runs slower than a normal Z80. But in this video, I'm taking it further. I've compressed the design down to a single EPROM, and I'm adding something you don't normally see in a Turing machine, pipelining. This one change lets me clock the system faster than the original ZX Spectrum ever ran. Will it work? Let's find out. Because the machine's so simple, everything, even the ALU operations, lives inside the state transition table in the finite state machine. All of that logic's burned into one large EEPROM. Originally, I needed three massive 2 meg by 16 bit EEPROMs just to get it running. In the last video, I managed to cut it down to two EEPROMs by adding something called a transfer register. Basically, an Octal D type flip flop that remembers the last byte written to memory. In this video here, I show how for the 6502 at least, this register halved the size of the rulebook. That 2 EEPROM Z80 based prototype actually worked, had reached the iconic ZX Spectrum boot screen, but I'm not done. I think I can make it even better. One EEPROM instead of two, and faster clock speeds than ever before. The EEPROM stores what's formerly called a state transition table. Each clock cycle works like this. Combine the current state with the symbol read from memory, use that to look up the next state, the symbol to write back to memory and the control signals. On the positive edge of clock, that data is latched into some output flip-flops. The state feeds back to the EEPROM, and the write symbol and control lines go to the memory system. There is a subtle timing dance. The right symbol updates memory immediately, but the control signals, like the notepad address, memory read and memory write, are meant to be applied for the next clock cycle. To handle that, I run them through another set of flip-flops clocked on the inverted CPU clock edge. Let's trace a couple of cycles. The notepad address and memory control signal become valid when CPU clock goes low. We do a static RAM memory read, either from the main memory or the notepad, but that takes about 80 nanoseconds. We feed that into the EEPROM, and then we have to wait another 100 nanoseconds for it to settle. Add another 20 nanoseconds for the flip-flops, then 80 nanoseconds to write the symbol back to the static RAM, and we're sitting right at about 280 nanoseconds total. So what's the problem? Well, I want to run the system at 3.579 MHz, the NTSC color subcarrier frequency, and that gives me just 280 nanoseconds per clock cycle. There's no wiggle room, and that's without counting any logic overhead. Worse, I need an asymmetric clock, low for 200 nanoseconds and high for 80, which is just ugly. Then I realised, what if I don't have to wait for memory and the EEPROM on the same clock cycle? This is where pipelining comes in. The basic idea is that instead of putting one combinatorial logic block after another, we break them up into stages or steps, then insert flip-flops between the steps. It takes more cycles to get the data through the pipeline, but it's faster. Ultimately, it's a trade-off between latency and throughput. In the upper case, we have to sum together the propagation delay of each step, and this determines our clock speed. But in the bottom case, the propagation delays overlap each other, and it's the slowest step that determines the clock rate rather than the sum of the delay of all the steps. That is, the same trick that gave risk processors their speed advantage back in the 1980s. For them, instead of doing fetch, decode and execute in sequence, risk processors overlap them, with flip-flops between them to form pipeline stages. While one instruction executes, the next is decoding, the instruction after that is being fetched. I think I can do the same thing here. What if I insert an extra register between the static RAM and the EEPROM? While the EEPROM looks up one symbol, the static RAM is already fetching the next symbol. The result? I hide the static RAM latency entirely. Suddenly, I only need 100 nanoseconds for the EEPROM lookup. Even with some other overhead, I can run a perfectly symmetric clock at around 4 MHz, faster than the original Spectrum actually ran. Of course, there's a problem. In a pipeline design, the EEPROM is always one symbol behind. If I run the existing state machine as is, everything would fall apart. If I add in a couple of simple restrictions to the state diagrams, 
I can make this work. This is the state diagram for instruction fetch. Now, at this point in the cycle, the program can is already loaded into the memory address registers. So, we do what you'd expect. Perform a static RAM read to fetch the instruction, then increment program counter low. If that increment lands us between 1 and 255, we're good. We just jump straight to the decode stage. From there, we fan off to one of a bunch of different state machines based on the instruction we read from main memory. If we read 0 hex, then we go down the no-op state machine pathway. The state machine for no-op is at state 592, but we know that no-op doesn't really do anything. So, it just leaves the temporary variable unchanged. And from there, it goes back to state 87 and starts the instruction fetch cycle again. But what happens when PCL was already at 255, or FF in hex? Now, we've got to roll over PCL to zero and increment PCH, the high byte of the program counter. That's normally by passing through an extra state, state 90, which only triggers once every 256 instructions. Simple enough, right? But here's where things get complicated. From state 88, where PCL is incremented, we typically move straight to state 91, where the instructions decoded. That arc assumes we're using the instruction register for the next operation. But if we roll over at FF, we instead jump to state 90 and increment PCH, which is a completely different register. And here's the twist. To make pipelining work, all outgoing arcs from a given state need to reference the same notepad register. If one arc tries to use the instruction register and another tries to use PCH, then I can't predict in advance what variable I need to read from the notepad. So what's the workaround? I insert a new dummy state, state 89 between state 88 and state 90. Here's how it plays out. All arcs from state 88 reference the instruction register, even the one leading to state 89. In state 89, we just read and write the instruction register without changing it, essentially no op. Then we proceed to state 90, where we increment PCH, and from there we move to state 91, again using the instruction register. Now, all arcs from a state use the same notepad register, and we only pay one extra clock cycle once every 256 instructions. That's a cost I'll happily take. And here's why it matters. It means, not only do I know what the notepad address is one clock cycle earlier, I can actually perform this read one clock cycle earlier and store the output in a pipeline register. Then, output this value into the EEPROM on the next clock cycle when it's actually needed. Let's zoom out to the big picture. Look at the paths, state 87, state 88, and state 91. Without pipelining, in state 88, I look up PCL, which is determined by the incoming arc. I run that through the EEPROM, which generates PCL plus 1 as the right symbol, the next state to go to, and which notepad variable I should read in the next clock cycle. If I have the right constraints in place, I can actually move the PCL lookup one clock cycle earlier. In state 87, we read PCL from the notepad SRAM. Instead of using it immediately, we store it in a flip-flop, another temporary register. Then, in state 88, we use that stored value to look up the EEPROM, apply our transition logic, and write PCL back to the static RAM. We've just pipelined the program catalog increment across two states. The read and write don't happen in the same state anymore. That's the key. If you look carefully, you'll spot a pattern. The notepad write register in one state is always the notepad read register from the previous state. That means we don't need to store both. What we need is one register to store the data and one register to hold the notepad write address. Then we apply both in the following state. It's a subtle change, but it transforms how the machine flows. The trade-off? Yes, this introduces a few more dummy states into the state machine. Yes, we need to make sure that there's at least one clock cycle delay between updating ma high or ma low and performing a read, which does add bubbles into the pipeline. Finally, we need to use a different notepad address every clock cycle, but that should be the case anyway. But the payoff? A dramatic speed up in the cycle time, and the Turing machine is starting to behave more like a modern pipeline CPU. But wait, just like every late night ad for a good set of steak knives, there's more. We've already overlapped the static RAM and EEPROM lookups. While clock slow, 
the EEPROM works in the current state using the symbol read in the previous clock cycle, which is stored in the pipeline register. When the clock goes high, we write the result into the static RAM, and during that half of the cycle though, the EEPROM is doing nothing. If you watched the earlier videos in the series, you'll remember I originally planned to use this idle half cycle for the raster generator EEPROM lookup. That's still an option, but I've got another idea. A crazy one. I want to see if I can compress the entire Z80 finite state machine down into one single EEPROM. Could be vain, but I think I can pull this off. It's going to be beautiful. Can we really do it? Here's the math. On the 6502 build, the transfer register cut the state count from 8,000 to about 3,000. If I apply the same trick to the Z80 and drop to 4-bit math for certain operations, just like the Z80 does, I can free up half the EEPROM. Normally, we read 32 bits in parallel from the EEPROM when clock's low, but what if I split that into two 16-bit reads? One 16-bit read when the clock's low, and another 16-bit read half a cycle earlier when clock's high. Symbol data comes from the static RAM. It's fetched in the first part of the previous cycle and stored in a flip-flop. Also good. So what are the inputs to the EEPROM? Well, the state's valid from the middle of the previous cycle, and we're good there. The symbol data coming from the notepad or main memory static RAM is fetched in the first part of the previous cycle and stored in the flip-flop. Also good. The output's from the EEPROM. 16 bits for the finite state variable don't need to change. What about the right symbol? That goes onto the data bus during the second half of clock. But it doesn't really matter if I latch the data in the middle of the current cycle or at the end of the last one. The data is stable either way. Same for the notepad address and M read M write signals. They're already fed into a latch that's clocked on the negative edge. So I can move the EEPROM and look up half a clock cycle earlier too. The result? Now I've got valid, usable data coming out of the EEPROM, both when the clock's high and when the clock's low. Instead of a single 32-bit read, I could split it into two 16-bit reads, which are half a cycle apart, twice the use out of the same chip, but it does mean the state machine has to fit into half the chip now. Normally, for the EEPROM lookup in blue, we'd use the blue SRAM read in the previous clock cycle, whose output's stored in the data pipeline register. But the idea behind the transfer register is to store the last piece of data written and fit it into the EEPROM instead of the data being read from the static RAM. I go into the reasons why this works in this video here, but basically it saves us from having to encode the data as state, and that saves us lots of rulebook state. But the problem here is that we want to ignore the blue SRAM read and transfer the data being written in red into the address lines during the blue EEPROM lookup. There are two easy ways to do that. Catch the right cycle from the red EEPROM read into a register and feed that into the blue EEPROM cycle, which actually makes more sense as I say it. Or you could use a transparent latch in the form of a 74HC373 sitting between the data bus and the address pins of the EEPROM. It's transparent when clock's high, so it transfers the red write data into the blue cycle. Then when clock goes low, the data is latched inside the 373, and the red SRAM write data is presented in the second part of the blue EEPROM read cycle. Both techniques should work, but it means I'm introducing another 7400 series chip type though, which I'm reluctant to do. That's all fine and well, but let's see how it translates to the schematic diagram. We have a single. 27C322 EEPROM, where address line A20 is connected to the CPU clock. This pair of flip-flops is clocked on the first negative edge of clock, while this pair is clocked on the positive edge of clock. The net result is 32 bits of output every full clock cycle. We have the transfer register here, which is a 74HC373 transparent latch, and beneath it we have a 74HC374, which is the data pipeline register. The output for these is controlled by a signal from the finite state machine called hold read. Over to the left of these chips, we have an input and output port for the in and out instructions. On the next page, we have the notepad and main memory in the same 128 kilobyte static RAM chip, a 628128. And while the notepad's assigned half the chip, it only actually uses 32 bytes. The main memory itself gets the other 64 kilobytes, but it uses all of that. 
the data bus of the static RAM is connected to the main data bus, which I've called the W bus. The address lines for the static RAM come from either the memory address registers shown here, or the notepad address registers. The upper 8 bits of the notepad address is just ground, but for the lower 8 bits, we have a read address register and a write address register. The read address is just a latched version of the notepad address from the finite state machine. The write address is the same notepad address, but it's delayed by an entire clock cycle. Finally, down here we have some logic to generate the signals we need from the outputs from the finite state machine. I built this, and I like it. A Z80 compatible machine with one large EEPROM, one static RAM, and mainly a bunch of Octal-D type flip-flops. Up the top, we have an Arduino Mega for testing, but this won't be used during normal operation. I've programmed the EEPROM, let's give it a whirl. Here's the output from the Arduino. We can see it running through a bunch of states, which I know are correct, so that means the pipeline register is working. I can see the address counting, which makes me think that the finite state machine is talking the notepad correctly, and I know that the transfer register is used in this sequence. But there's a problem. At the moment, it's copying the ZXpect from ROM stored in the state machine into the main memory static RAM. It's writing F3 first, which is the disable interrupt instruction. That's correct. But then it writes D2 in hex and 4F. I know from the Spectrum's ROM that the correct sequence is F3, AF, and 1-1. One, one. What's going on? Well, after a bunch of sleuthing, I've actually found a design mistake. These two signals are meant to be the non-inverted forms of CPU clock and hold read. I was latching the pipeline register on the wrong edge of clock. Once I fixed that up, we're off to the races, and it worked. In the next video, I'm going to add on the Raston generator, which is basically the same as the Raston generator from the ZX Spectrum No ULA playlist. So let's see if I can get the whole machine to run at speed in the next video.